Joining us now is uh, the only man to, to speak to uh, um, Gosnell while he has been in prison. And we welcome in Steve Volk of uh, Philadelphia Magazine, who is the author of a new ebook called Gosnell's Babies. Hello, how are you, sir? Hey, thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. Okay, so um, you t talk about your access to, uh, to um, Kermit Gosnell. You know, as I was watching the trial, um, I've seen a lot of criminal trials, and the weight of the charges against the defendant is usually uh, visible. Uh, you know, you, you can just see they look heavy, they look haggard, they may offer a smile here or there to an attorney or a loved one in the gallery. But, you know, the reality of what's, what's happening to them is, is present, you know, on their faces and in their posture. But Dr. Gosnell uh, bore the charges against him almost lightly. Um, he he smiled almost incessantly, uh, and then we never got to s hear what he had to say. And so I was really, uh, you know, just as a, a reporter, intrigued. You know, who who is this guy? And so uh, I approached his his defense attorney afterward, and I'm you know I've been working here in Philly for a while, um, you know, doing crime stories, and so I think I was you know a little bit known to him, and and I, I managed to to you know, talk to his defense attorney and gain access to, to Gosnell himself. Okay, uh, so you gain access to him, and uh, wh what impressions did you come away with, uh, or did you gain while talking to him, uh, and how did they differ from your impressions of viewing him in the courtroom? Well, you know... Or did you gain while talking to him, uh, and how did they differ from your impressions of viewing him in the courtroom? Well, you know... Right, to just sort of cut to the chase. Um, uh, what was that? Well... You know, I think we were dealing with a guy here who was so um, committed to his belief in the pro-choice movement and also, um, you know, and take this as you will, I understand this will be offensive to some people, but a, a religious guy, professes to be a religious guy, and he had this kind of self-righteous sort of sense of himself, and I, and I think it became uh, very easy for him anyway to rationalize all the choices he made in light of these beliefs. And uh, you know, and he ended up where he did. Well, okay. So, so talk talk about because I I, I heard you uh, talk about uh, uh, the fact that uh, you think he was a true believer in in, in abortion rights, and uh, that that's what this story is about. How uh, you said a self righteous belief in yourself and your own authority spirals out of control. Yeah. Um. I I don't know I don't know what that says about. Uh, abortion right zealots, and I don't know what that says about him, and I'm not sure if, you, if it sounds like you're trying to rationalize the killing of live babies by no. cutting their spines while they, after they're born. So tell me what you mean by all that. Yeah, well, you know, if you look at his history, he was, um, he was doing abortions before Roe, and he, uh, you know, obviously continued after Roe. He went to New York and worked in, in you know, the first, uh, quote, legal clinic there when the state moved to, to legalize abortion in New York, and he worked there for several months. Um, he, he was there at the ground floor of all this. You know, he attended the conferences. He was, uh, uh, you know, a, a part of that industry. And, um, and I think for him, and, and that's the, th the thing, you've got to try and recognize where I'm speaking for me, which is a very limited portion of this and where I'm speaking for him to just try and relate what he was what he was thinking and then you know my understanding of him I think for him uh, working with uh, you know sort of the poor and the indigent he felt there was a, a real real need for this service nothing was going to sidetrack him from that even uh, the law ultimately and I found it you know very disturbing to 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 interact with this guy and find that when you know when you weren't talking about these charges, when you were just sort of getting to know him, there's a real charisma there and a real intelligence, and you could see how he he kind of got by in the world uh, all these years. But once we turned to the facts of his case, his logic becomes so um, twisted to sort of suit his purposes and suit the sense of himself that he had. Um, that he became at times really kind of disturbing to talk to because I, you know, I could see how in his mind this rationalization made some sense, but it wouldn't make any sense to, to I, I would think, most anyone else. Well, he, he told you he's going to prove his innocence, right? 
that's what he said he was going to set out to do. But like, you gotta you gotta understand that like, you know he he basically he virtually confessed to most of the charges. So he but and yet would say that that these arguments proved his innocence. So to give you an example, you know, on the matter of performing abortions past the the state mandate and li- limit here of 24 weeks, um, he kept. It was a convoluted argument. I mean, he kept insisting first that when he wrote 24.5 weeks on the chart, 24.5 should be rounded down mathematically, which let's just even set that aside as a, as a mathematical argument for a second. And I said to him, you know, Dr. Gus, no, let's say we round that down. It rounds down to 24. It's still illegal. Then he started talking about how the law was vague. And then within all this, he admitted to me that, that he tilted the transducer on the ultrasound, he would he would basically do a manual. This is his story. He would do a manual examination on the on the woman or the or the girl. Face it, because some of these people were teenagers. Right. He would do a manual examination, uh, looking for the, sort of the fundal height, right, the size of the the uterus, and um, and then if he got a reading there that he felt comfortable with in terms of performing an abortion, he would, if necessary, fake the ultrasound to make the fetus appear smaller. Yeah, this guy, um, yeah, this guy. <laughs> and he justifies yeah, I mean, that yet, in his own mind, right? Right, and then he would say that that makes it legal, and and I'm, how, what do you say to somebody when they Is he, do you, do you think he, do, well, do you think he's sane or insane? Well, you know, I stayed away within the story from making any sort of clinical diagnosis. As a reporter, I mean, you know, I'm not a clinician, and I and if I call psychiatrists, they never want to weigh in and say this is what I think you're dealing with. Right. But I also don't mind in, in a setting like this one. You know, yeah, I think he's got uh, an issue there. I think there's some sort of narcissism. There's there's like a god complex happening. I think part of that smile is. Um, I, I truly believe that when people fail to see things the way he does, instead of seeing that as a reason to check his own thinking, he sees it as a sign of how much brighter he is than the rest of us. Yeah. We're, ta- we're talking to uh, Steve Volk of Philadelphia Magazine uh, here on the Steve Malsberg Show. His ebook Gosnell's Babies, uh, is all about uh, Kermit Gosnell. He had access to him in prison, and you could hear some of the craziness uh, that took place during those interviews. Um, now, let me, let me just ask you. You were on uh, Jake Tapper's uh, um, uh, show on CNN the other day, and um, CNN— uh, covered the Jody Arias trial more in one day than the Kermit Gosnell trial in eight weeks, and this was very symptomatic and, and uh, of the uh, of the entire so-called mainstream media. Um, they they just shied away from it. There were excuses. Well, it's a local story. It's not a national story. Uh, meanwhile, this is a, a mass murderer who killed little babies that were born alive. Uh, a woman died. It was poor women that were affected. Uh, this guy kept feet and body parts of the babies that he killed, uh, and 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 the media didn't care. Yeah, I've got a, a sort of a two-pronged response for you on this one. Um, I think that that um. It can't be – when we talk about a, a, a trial sort of becoming like a show trial and, a, and a, you know, part of our national conversation where everybody's talking about it, like the Arias trial or, or you know, going all the way back, obviously, to the trial that started it all, right, the O.J. Simpson trial, um, something to understand here that I think just really shouldn't be lost is that we, we here in Philly, they do not allow um, cameras. cameras in the right. courtroom. Mm-hmm. That is a big deal for television. You know, it just it just is. Even Fox, with as much coverage as they devoted to it in terms of people sort of rehashing the coverage that came out during the day, they did not have a reporter there in the courtroom day after day uh, doing their own reporting. And I have to tell you, that trial was so complicated and strange and, and emotionally uh, taxing, right, because of the, the material involved, that if you didn't have a reporter there to sift through the material yourself, you know, you really were, I mean, you, you, know, you were kind of relying on the kindness of strangers and the judgment of strangers in terms of what they thought was important. But why and didn't they have, why didn't all the networks have reporters there? I, you know, I, I, I can't answer that question. I think part of it is the, the lack of moving images. And I would just point out in terms of, the, like, the, the mainstream media side of this, I mean, I, I'm still shocked that Fox didn't have a report. Well, I mean, Fox aside, I mean, uh, you know, they, they could do what they want, but, uh, you know, I, I could go down the whole entire list sure. uh, oh, of okay. majors. Made me out. Now, now you, do you believe really in your heart that if an abortion 
doctor in Philadelphia had been shot by I don't know some uh, you know right to right winger or or uh, or, or right to lifer uh, in Philadelphia, and that guy was put on trial. You think they'd say, well, there's no TV cameras, we're not going to send anybody? Come on. It's a great question. I mean, I look, I. I th- I think personally that the lack of cameras is a really big deal, but I don't want to hide from this. I said I had a double-pronged sort of response. I do think this is an uncomfortable story for the left. You know, it just is. I mean, because they can make the argument that what this speaks to is issues of access, and, and there's something to that, but there's also, you know, if you spend any time in, in digging into this case, you have to deal with the physical realities in particular of second trimester abortion, because that's what Gosnell specialized in. Right. And it is gruesome. Yeah. And, I, and I do not believe that, that most people really want to confront that. And well, I, when, and you I, say, when you say most people, do you mean the audience doesn't want to hear about it? Or do you mean that the, when you say uh, it's a, a difficult for the left to confront, are you saying, as I would say, that the left runs the newsrooms in this country and they had no interest in, in dealing with this? No, you know, look, I mean, I'm here in Philadelphia, one of the most liberal cities uh, in America, and we went with this as a, as a sort of a, a national story, right? So I, I, I think that ultimately... Um, if you are not already vested in the details of the of the abortion issue, right? This is it's just a very hard case to stomach. And I, I even think that part of the reason, and I'll tell you this, I mean, I don't mind sharing this with you. I talked to a Fox producer. They did come in for a few days here and there during the trial, and I talked to a Fox producer who said this story is very hard to make sort of relatable and powerful. All right, well, I'll give you another, I'll give you one more example, and you might say another good, another good question or very good question, uh, and that is if this was a, a mass murderer in Philadelphia who, uh, who, who kidnapped uh, five-year-olds and, ha- and, 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 and had a systematic way of having sex with them and cutting their body uh-huh. parts up and hiding them in various <laughs> parts. Out, now, now, now you th- <laughs> you, no matter how complicated that was and why he did it and where the body parts were and all, you don't think that would add to the intrigue of covering that case, even with without yeah. cameras in the courtroom? I, you, you, I don't want you to, to come away with the idea that, like, I'm... I'm no, I, and I'm just asking, I'm just, I wanted you to say another very good question, Steve. <laughs> oh, it is a very good question, Steve, because look, here's the thing. I mean, uh, again, I'll, I'll just say this. I experienced this yesterday. I got some kind of uh, horrible review of, of the Gosnell's Baby's uh, uh, e-book by uh, Amanda Marcotte from uh, Slate, who, who said that there was no new information in it. It, which to me was a little bit like saying, hey, there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to see here, move along, move along. All right, right? well, let me, let, me, let me give you one, and I'll end it on this. Yeah. I did an interview with a gentleman, maybe you want to pick up on this and write this for Philadelphia Magazine, a guy named Stephen Jimenez. You know Stephen Jimenez? I've heard the name. Okay, do you know the book, The Book of Matt? No. No, and you see, that speaks volumes. Stephen Jimenez, a, a award-winning journalist, a, openly gay man, wrote a book called The Book of Matt, um, and I forget what the rest of it is. It's about the death of Matthew Shepard. Oh, and, okay, I've heard of this. Yeah, 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 but the fact is, I had him on. And you know who else had him on in, the, in ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSN, MSNBC? Nobody. This guy did investigation, 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 and came up with a whole new scenario for the death of Matthew Shepard, one of the most iconic murders in recent history, and nobody gives a darn to talk about it because it doesn't meet their agenda. So I, I ask you to look into that. Maybe you'll write about that and talk to him, and I think that fits right in with this. Uh, okay. I mean, I, it, to, to, for, for me, I thought what you were going to take this honestly was the idea that whether or not there are other guys now, right? Oh, well, I know there are. The guy in Texas has been accused, and there I'm sure there are others we don't even know about. But uh, I'm just saying, I, you know, uh, as far as the media goes, um, I think, uh, like I said, if this was a different, complicated, gruesome, uh, hard-to-explain case without cameras that didn't involve abortion um, and make it look bad, they would be all over it. You know, I have to tell you, another, another part of this that really bothered me in terms of the media's lack of coverage is if you look at these show trials, at the end of the day, most of them, right, and the, the Trayvon Martin case was different, but most of them involve somewhere at the center of them some attractive woman, right? And, and it seems that's what viewers, I don't, well, I don't want to say it's what viewers get drawn to necessarily because it's what they're offered, right? Yeah, well. But, but a lot of times it ends up being built around that. And I think a case that was built largely around poor African Americans also was just uh, sort of deemed unappealing. 
Well, and again, then, I'll, I'll say that a poor African Americans were the victims uh, of, a, of somehow uh, a evil uh, conservative Republicans. Uh, I, it would be the trial of the century. But hey, well, listen, Steve, I appreciate your time. And uh, the, the ebook, folks, is Gosnell's Babies. And uh, we thank you and good luck. Hey, thanks very much for having me. My pleasure. Steve Volk, right. ladies and gentlemen. Wow, good conversation. You want to weigh in? 855-777-9660. Uh, did the media stay away from that because it's too complicated and because there was no cameras in the courtroom and no pretty woman involved in the case? Uh, I don't think so. 855-777-9660 on the Steve Malsberg Show.